Hey everybody, it's Dr. Cody Raw with Tech for Psych. Today we're interviewing Brain Boost, a neurofeedback company based in Germany that's making big waves and redefining how brainwave technology can be used for performance training and mental health treatment. I first learned about Brain Boost from a webinar put on by MindLift, which created an online clinical neurofeedback software program for the Muse headband. I learned a ton from Tobias, Philip, and Lisa in this talk with topics ranging from the history of neurofeedback and its challenges, the use of mobile home care neurofeedback platforms, and the development of their own in-house technology that could potentially push the entire field forward into the homes of everyday users. Unfortunately, the Skype program that I used did not have as wide of a range of visual field as I thought, so poor Lisa got cut out of the shot. I did my best to get her back in there, but overall, it's still great audio for everyone to listen to and learn from. Hope you enjoy it. All right, so starting it off, Dr. Pitterell with Tech for Psych here, talking with Brain Boost. Thanks so much for doing this, you guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah. So what I'd like to do first is uh, for you guys just to uh, introduce the team. Uh, just give me, you know, your name and your background and what you do at Brain Boost. Yeah, so I'll start. My name is Tobias, Tobias Heiler. Um, I'm one of the founder of Brain Boost, um, Philip's brother. Uh, from my background, I studied in Germany and I'm German. Um, I study sports science and I have an MBA. So I work a lot with athletes, professional musicians, um, but also people with medical conditions and also have a business uh, background. Mm -hmm. All right, so Philip, um, I'm a medical doctor, but I didn't go exactly the way most medical doctors in Germany would go. So right after I finished med school, I didn't go to the hospital to uh, go into some specifics. I rather founded this company and also um, started my own practice completely focused on neurofeedback. I did this because there is not a lot to learn in hospitals about neurofeedback at this point. I hope that this will change at some point. And since I didn't just want to offer what was out there and have this practice running, I founded Brain Boost to, together with my brother. And we have the aim to improve the technology itself, to find new use cases, and also to bring it to, to more people. So I would say I'm a, a medical doctor specialized in neurofeedback with some business interest. Mm -hmm. Hey, I'm Lisa, Lisa Hitch. I work at Brain Boost. I studied health mm -hmm. science in my bachelor's. And I'm mainly a neurofeedback therapist here, but I also work a lot in the corporate health field. So I do, um, you know, the brain reports, the analysis, EG analyses in the companies. That's great. It's great to have you guys here on the channel. I'm excited to talk about neurofeedback. Um, you know, I, I kind of have a unique perspective because I talk a lot about what I call personal EEG devices, these devices that people can use and sort of get engaged with EEG technology. And I think that, uh, it's getting people uh, more interested than ever in, in what the brain does and how to use that. Um, I was just curious to hear you guys' perspective on um, you know, how you came to start Brain Boost and um, where you see neurofeedback going and if you feel like it's uh, changed in recent years because you know, there are a couple of factors including like less expensive technology, more access to it, all that uh, and all the above. Um, and, and also one point that I just wanted to make before we dive too much into it is that um, you, you know, you guys are an established brick and mortar uh, clinic, right? You've got uh, patients that come in and see you regularly and that sort of thing. So I just wanted to make that point before we dive into it. So if you could just give a, like a background on Brain Boost and where you see the company going, I'd, yeah, it'd be great. Okay, so th th those were a few questions. Yeah, I know, sorry. <laughs> uh, no, it's fine, it's fine. Yeah. Let's start at the beginning because I think what's interesting, I'm um, talking about neurofeedback and the prior development and also the future outlook of neurofeedback is that it is very different depending on which country, country or which location you are in. So I think this will be probably totally different from Germany to the US, for example. I think it's it's depending on the society, on the health system, on the, um, um, the persp perspective that people have towards technology and so on. So in general, I would say talking about Germany, we are looking at a rather conservative market from the consumer point of view. And something that ha or where people believe that the medical system and doctors and hospitals have a very high expertise and they also appreciate that high expertise. So I think that in, in Germany, there might be people more interested in going to hospitals to doctors and not as quickly adopting, for example, wearable systems or home-based systems. Mm -hmm. So I think this is also um, playing to that. So when we started out with, with neurofeedback and looking at the technology, which was rather random, there were some like newspaper articles, and then we started to 
take a look at that, looking at who is offering it already, how does it work, giving it a try. We, we did not start looking at at like wearable devices because they were not so popular in Germany at all. Now later on, I figured you know in a different country we would probably have started with a home wearable device, but we didn't. So we we went to therapists and also started with doing a, like a, um, a training and buying a medical class neurofeedback device. This is what we started out with before we came to also using wearable devices. Mm-hmm. I think what is also interesting. Uh, as Philip mentioned, the, the market or the people are different, different countries. And with Brain Boost, we founded a company where we first aim to train peak performance, and we will come to that later, I think. So we our first intention was to um, let people benefit that don't have an obvious medical condition. And But then we figured out rather quickly that in Germany, there is a bigger market at first um, for medical conditions. So then Philip founded his practice where he does treatments, for people with PTSD, autism, ADD, ADHD, and so on. So I think the German market is is sort of weak with uh, in terms of early adopting um, and is rather conservative. And I think the US market maybe there is more uh, openness for telematic medicine, uh, remote neurofeedback and stuff like that. So to summarize, we found a brain boost to do peak performance training and help athletes and managers and so on, but then it kind of uh, turned into a, a to a different audience that has medical conditions which retro perspective um, is good because there you have you know so many different um, so many different conditions where you really learn about the brain and how to train the brain um, and I think this is very beneficial for also peak performance clients we have now what I sorry what I would, what I would like neurofeedback to like go or develop in which way is when I look at the development of physical fitness over the last 50 years. So, uh, you know, going back 50 years or something, you had Arnold and bodybuilders and so on. But, you know, for normal people, a gym was not something to go to. It was rather for like people who had nothing else to do. And so over the last 50 years, it developed more and more towards um, um, something that is for the, a broader audience and for, for pretty much everybody. So in a bigger city like Munich, Everybody at least has a gym membership, which you know doesn't mean that you go there, but it it feels like this is part of life. And there is insurances covering parts of this, um, and there is uh, fitness companies. And I think this will also drive the um, the sales for for devices to use at home. So I hope that we are starting now. Or we already have started and seeing a similar development that in well 15, 20, 30 years people feel like the mental fitness is as important as the physical fitness and they accept that it's part of life and they accept that they might have to go to uh, like a a center or something one or two times a week and then in between they can work at home with devices or without devices you know practicing meditation or mindfulness exercises and stuff like this and i think when you have this wider acceptance and the also the, the knowledge that it will benefit or improve your quality of life then i think also people will be more willing to to adopt it even if they don't have a medical problem. What we see now is that people mainly come when they have a problem, an actual problem they want to solve, but not everybody that goes to a gym is goes there to solve a problem. People do it to prevent problems, to feel better, to feel energized. And I think you know, going there is one of our um, wishes um, with Brain Boost in the future. And I think then it's uh, it could be a good combination of like stationary centers where you have professionals, professional machines, but also instructions and knowledge on how to use wearable technology for neurofeedback. So you definitely do see like a a balance there, it sounds like, where, you know, you're coming in the clinic, but also getting training at home. Um, And do you think that that could take, you know, multiple different forms? Yeah, uh, what I think and maybe Lisa can, can say something about that, since uh, she is in a corporate health sector, does a lot of screening in, in companies, and here in Munich we have Siemens, BMW, you know, uh, Munich uh, um, insurances and so on, um, that the neurofeedback or mental health is rather an unknown unknown, so people don't even know that they don't know about it, okay? So, um, and when we go to, to companies, and it's kind of tough, you know, to acquire they as, uh, them as a customer, um, to pitch them, you know, we can train your brain. They, are, they think it's fancy and, you know, it's, it's magic. Um, but then maybe you can say something about that. I think a combination of remote neurofeedback that is cost efficient 
and like stationary sophisticated EEG amps are, are pretty cool. And maybe you can say some, uh, tell some experience about the screenings and companies and how we could implement it there. Yes. So I think um, the whole movement towards prevention that's going on around the world basically right now kind of started and we kind of uh, use, you know, those screenings, the EEG screenings that we use in companies um, to fulfill this need for prevention because we did so much medical neurofeedback here and we just realized people, they want a simple tool, they want something very, you know, understandable, something simple they can have, they can use so they understand what's going on in their brain. So that's how it all developed. We went into companies, we developed um, an EEG screening, a brain report, that's how we call it. And we measured different activities, different positions on the brain. We also measured different ratios in the brain. And all these ratios, they correspond to different kinds of states in the brain. So for example, we have activation, concentration, we have relaxation. Um, we also have something like ruminating thoughts, um, stress. So we can measure all these things and within a couple minutes, we can print out a report, we can give it to the people, we can talk to the people, see if what we measured objectively, if that's also you know true in their daily lives. And we kind of have this conversation going and then the people or most people that we've done it with, they're so amazed by what we can measure in only a couple minutes in the brain they didn't know that you can measure, that you can look into this kind of black box mm -hmm. in the brain. And so we talked to the people, they're really amazed. And then suddenly they realized, well, just like Philip said, just like a physical training, I can also train my brain. It's also a mental training that I can do. So we give them the opportunity to do like a mental fitness challenge, that's what we call it. It's basically remote neurofeedback. So they can measure the brain activity. They maybe have a certain you know, goal within eight weeks to better relax or better concentrate. And it really helps people to have this first assessment, EEG screening, and to then have a plan what they can do, just like a fitness plan, they can work towards their own goals. They collect like, you know, mental fitness minutes or something like that to also have the team spirit. So I think from the business perspective, what we experience is you need at some point it's like physical training. You cannot, you know, do only a physical training at home with your own dumbbells. You know, you, you buy at Costco or something. You need at some point someone who teaches you or gives you at least a push. And this is what we experience here in the in the market of uh, companies and um, corporate health uh, market. We are the experts. We come there. We have sophisticated EGMs, do screenings where you really need expertise. But then the follow up eight weeks mental fitness challenge or so on, you can use wearables, remote neurofeedback devices, because there you don't treat people, you train people. Because when they come to our practice with medical conditions, in Germany at least, they don't feel so comfortable simply using, you know, a $300 device they put on their head. They want, you know, fancy equipment that is FDA approved and so on. But in companies, you have a good access in Germany. Um, companies pay for that kind of stuff and insurances pay for that stuff. So I think this is a nice, a market opener and um, yes Lisa does a lot with executives but also with you know all kinds of people that have you know that are managers in different uh, uh, areas and um, they get a different salary but they can all benefit from it and, and since it's cost-effective uh, remote your feedback yeah uh, what we do at that point and I think this is what basically summarizes brain boost is mm -hmm. that we offer companies or also individual customers the perfect solution for them and for their needs that fits them perfectly. So if a company says after a screening day or something, hey, um, we want for our for those 20 employees, we want them to have a eight week program, then we say, all right, we have wearable, we have a setup, we have a challenge built around it so they stay motivated, mm -hmm. there you go. If a company says, hey, um, we want this in our company, we want this technology in our company, please, you know, next to our regular gym, build us a room that is focused on neurofeedback training on mind and uh, mind gym or brain gym whatever we want this then we can say okay we can do this for you we can help you build this up and we can deliver the equipment we can de deliver the expertise and so on so as you as you said or as you like or we think in our opinion that having this variety of options that fits the exact need is the best way to go and i think the only thing you need to be aware of is that you don't promise too much so for example we if you communicate you know a wearable device 
you know, if, if someone comes here and says, my, my, my kid has autism spectrum, and you say, okay, take this for two weeks and it will be gone, then this will be a problem at some point. So I think communication and being honest with your clients and managing expectations, this is what's very important. It will also be for, for all of us working in the field of neurofeedback on the long term, this will be good for us. Because if there's too many promises made that um, are like, okay, you need a 200 euro device and then you can crank up the speed of your managers by or your executive by 20%, this will just not work and this will, would destroy our market, I think. And so, you know, keeping it in the balance, keeping it realistic, I think this is what is key. And then this can also develop in a, in a serious way that people understand how it works, what it can do, but also what it can't do. And then, you know, this will establish as a yeah, serious and important technology. I think one more thing that, that maybe yeah. you want some questions, but um, <laughs> That's right. talk about is talking about chances and risks. And I think the mental fitness sector where it is not similar, but rather very different to the um, like your physique training um, when you go to the gym is that you don't really have a baseline. I mean, people don't if people are obese or if people are very skinny, they know themselves, they have a reference and they know, oh, I should do something. Um, but with your mental fitness, it's kind of tough. You know, you don't realize yourself and say, oh, I cannot remember any or uh, things or I have a bad sleep. Is it normal or not normal? And I think this is also where a lot of players work a lot with fear and, you know, send a message, oh, everyone needs a mental fitness training and you are next, you have a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and also the expectations, how can you measure that it, you know, it, you benefit from it after three months of mental fitness training? When you go to the gym, you have weights, you have objective data. And this is, I think, also something we can talk about in more depth that we do some screenings, we measure baselines, but you know, you, if you had a bad sleep or you, you, know, you, have, you, know, you got divorced, obviously this changes everything dramatically. It doesn't change your muscles or your fat, but it changes your mood, your state of mood. So, um, so I think, and even though with the remote neurofeedback, when you measure the brain activity every session, it still it rather trains in your flexibility mm -hmm. and not changes your, your entire system, it, you know, into a completely different level. It enables, you know, functionally um, what the brain can do. And I think this is a very tough field that has chances, but also risks where uh, with aggressive commercials or, you know, aggressive claims, uh, some people will, will work with a lot of fear. Um, yeah, definitely a good point. I think that your guys' philosophy of, uh, you know, being positive about it rather than capitalizing on the fear is really admirable, you know. Um, and you brought up another uh, good point that I think that people would be interested in is kind of getting into the nuts and bolts of what those screening tools look like when you actually are making an assessment with people. Um, and then talking a little bit about uh, the different tools that you guys have at your disposal in terms of what uh, technology you're using for the you know, I'll, I'll just say it right out, the quantitative EEG and what, what tools you guys are using for the clinic treatment and what kind of tools you guys are using for the at-home uh, training. Yeah, maybe Philip, as, as our medical doctor, you can sketch a typical way a customer or a patient or client. We separate patient and client. Patient for us is someone with a medical condition and a client is someone, an executive manager or athlete, um, stuff like that. Maybe you can sketch how this usually goes. Sure, and also maybe some some prior thoughts about it. So obviously, all we're going to say is what we believe and how we work here, which does not necessarily mean that everything else is bad. I mean, we just had this idea of focusing on the thing we do, which even meant that we focused on one kind of neurofeedback training, for example. We do mainly frequency band or amplitude training. I don't know, like it's a synonym in my opinion. But um, so we do mainly this, which does not mean as we think everything else is bad, but you know, we do have some opinions about some stuff. So obviously, yeah, yeah sorry. To Toby uh, explained this to me the other day uh, when we had a call that I thought was, was really great. And I'd, I appreciate it if you could talk a little bit about that again. It's uh, the difference between Z-score training and the amplitude training and how the Z-score kind of returns a person back to normal, whereas amplitude yeah. might be more used for high performance. Could you guys talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah, okay. Maybe, yeah, it, it kind of correlates to the QEG mm -hmm. and maybe the brain report in, in, the, in the business field, you can, you can sketch it a little mm -hmm. bit how this usually goes, please. Yeah, so uh, a common tool to do assessments in neurofeedback is what's called the quantitative EEG. What you do for that is that you record a regular EEG signal. So this means, for example, a 19-channel EEG recording according to the 20, uh, 1020 system. That means you will end up with some scribbly lines that you have and they consist of measurement points. And so the idea now is to get some information out of this 
of these lines is to compare them to some sort of database. And there are several databases out there. For example, one that is probably the most famous is NeuroGuide made by Thatcher. And then there is, we use QEG Pro, which is like a, located in the Netherlands, which is will give you very similar results to the database from NeuroGuide. So this also kind of shows you, okay, probably this database is not completely wrong if another database that was independently created is somewhat similar. So what this database shows you is the standard, I always mix it up, deviation or derivation? Deviation, deviation right? Deviation, yeah, yeah. Deviation, yeah, okay. So the standard deviation um, of certain parameters of EEG compared to someone the same sex and the similar age. So let's say put my EG in there, I'm 29, and then you will get um, comparison to people who are 28, 29, and 30 years old, male and right-handed, for example. And then you decide whether the condition is eyes open or eyes closed. So, and the EG parameters are mainly amplitude values, so or powers basically, so the amplitude, and then you can see asymmetries between two points, and then you can see um, coherence between points, face lag, and so on. So lots of values that are being generated, and what you can see then at the, at the, the typical QEG reporting is just the standard deviation value. So it will, for example, show you that my alpha amplitude is plus 2.5 mm -hmm. SDs. And so this means, just putting it objectively, this means that I have a higher alpha amplitude than, I don't know, 97% of most people in my age and so on. And so this gives you information, but it doesn't automatically mean that everything that is not normal is, is wrong. But if someone is, I don't know, at a point where 99.999% of people have a different activity, and he has problems that fit fit these these um, values. Mm -hmm. Then you know you can say, okay, there is probably a correlation between the two of them. So this means when you're looking at the brain maps, you will get this coloring and see if there is a high deviation or low deviation or whatever. And then you can say, okay, and this is what we usually do: we look at the brain mappings and then we say, okay, um, let's let's see if this fits the symptoms. Okay, person has ADD. Um, problems and then we see okay there's a lot of theta activity in the front lobe very high amplitudes in theta this would fit okay so probably this will be a uh, part of the problem um, what we saw there too but this is something you can talk about later Lisa is that we often saw that those brain mappings didn't give you very specific points that were very red or very blue or something it was rather bigger parts of the brain covered in certain colors mm -hmm. So, yeah, the, the different lobes or just, you know, quarters of the brain were colored, usually. So for the brain report, we said, hey, how can we make this tool quicker so we don't need to put on like a 20-channel cap for everybody? So we saw that with a four-channel recording, which we do on the position FZ and then C3, C4 and PZ, so kind of like just putting a, a rectangle on the head, um, we will in 95% in of all cases we would get the same result than we do for a brain mapping if we did the whole brain mapping and so for medical cases we still do a 19 channel recording also because it gives us you know more information but we said hey for a preventive setting or for a quick screening we could go with a four channel setup and this is what we did and you can talk about this later on so this means you know, for we, we try to create a use case where we are not completely losing a lot of information, but still we could reduce the complexity of this measurement to something that is can be done in a total of five minutes, for example. This was the step one. And, you know, now I will continue with what we do in the practice usually. So there is, I would say, three bigger ways to do neurofeedback or three common ways to do neurofeedback. One is what we do. This is called amplitude training. This means we pick specific amplitude values like alpha, theta, beta, mm -hmm. and then we try, or at least let's say this is how you could explain it easily, then you try to help the patient to learn to modify certain activity levels, so to modify certain amplitudes. You try to help them create more alpha activity to go into a more relaxed state. Mm -hmm. You help them to create, reduce theta activity to be more focused, something like this. And so this is what we usually do. We do a constellation of these activities. And there is no zero there is no baseline uh, com compared to the qg or z score training yeah you just yeah. you just work with the absolute values and so another idea was um 
Oh, that's just there's this other bigger parts of training that's called SCP training or ILF, ISF. They are working with those slow cortical potentials and some fluctuation in in brain potentials. We don't do this a lot. It's just in, in Germany, it's actually rather common, more common than in the US, I think. But we don't work with it. So I'm not going to say a lot about it. But it's just generally you have two electrodes that are active and you measure certain potential fluctuations between those electrodes that are not usually, as if I'm correct, you know, that are not usually linked to like an, an immediate change of brain activity. These are often very slow fluctuations that go over several seconds and minutes. So it's not that you can directly see what's going on in the brain. It's rather that you, you work with the general fluctuation, general regulation of the brain. And then the third is called live Z-score training. So Z-score means just that you're using standard deviations. And this means this training aims to do a, a live brain mapping of 1 to 20 channels, depending on which protocol you're using. And then it will define certain borders of deviation. So for example, everything that's in between 2 and minus 2. And this is considered let's say good, let's put it simple, this is considered good. If most values are somewhere where they should be in an average person, then this is probably good. If they are too far out of that corridor, then that's probably not good. And so then you usually have a certain percentage of values that you are try or that the person is trying to move into that corridor. And whenever he succeeds in that, then the reward is triggered. And if there's too many values going out, so your alpha, alpha is going too, ho, uh, too high, your uh, beta is going too low, and then this will stop the positive feedback. And so this is something that has the benefits that it makes it very easy for the therapist to set up because you don't need to think about the actual values. You will always see a comparison to some database, which makes people feel safe when they use it. Um, also, it's not, a very, uh, it's not a training where you usually expect very a drastic reaction. So for example, if you do an alpha training with someone who is um, post-traumatic, then this person can get emotional outbursts and start crying or something like this. You usually don't see this with Z-score training because you're always looking at very like a high number of values. Um, the negative, possibly negative points could be that, you know, you're, people claim that you're only normalizing people, but I don't think that it's that crass, you know, that you're actually normalizing people, but kind of like sounds like this also what some patients say no i don't want my my child to be you know like just averaged out or something like this okay. and also maybe that it's not specific enough so it it's probably works well when you have someone who has a big problem in regulation in general mm -hmm. then probably this is this is working well but you know um it's often that you, as a therapist, you don't really see what's going on right now. You can see there's a lot of Z-scores out of the corridor, but once you have figured out which ones they are, they can already be back. And so with an amplitude training, at every point, you can tell the person why he's not getting a positive feedback right now. Because you can see one of the three amplitudes we're involving in the training is above or beneath the threshold, and that's the reason. And then you can analyze, okay, this is high beta. So are you maybe too stressed? Are you trying too hard or stuff like this? And this also leads to the peak performance uh, training because with the Z-score training, you can only train someone to the zero, to the norm, so train someone normal. Um, so you need a database that defines normal. So this is in a relaxed state, sitting with eyes you know, closed. But as soon as you have you know, an athlete that says, I want to hyper-focus because I'm are you shooting or something, or uh, a professional musician that wants to get into the flow, there is no database for flow or for hyper-focus. So, what you cannot train, you know, to a zero, then you don't have, you don't have, you know, a tool. So this is where you need amplitude or frequency band training. So you really guide someone into a certain state where there is no database, there is no zero. There is simply diving very, very deep into a hyper focus. Everyone knows how to, you know, has experienced a hyper focus or you know try to hyper focus. So there is no zero. There is, you know, you can always get better at it. And um, yeah. I think yeah, so, so this is why, for example, when we record professional orchestra musicians, QEEGs, then we see that they all are not normal. They all have like exceptional patterns of brain activity. And this is probably what gives them their abilities, you know, to actually do what they do. And so I wouldn't say that a few sessions of Z-score training would take that away from them, but obviously, you know, this is kind of like the way that, or an argument why you should not use Z-score training. And maybe 
you can tell us something about the, the screening yeah. tool we developed. Since um, the 19 channel um, QEG um, is very sophisticated and gives a high resolution um, point of view, and we use it also to, you know, uh, argue with uh, insurances, health insurances, that you know, to cover the cost because that way we have a sophisticated medical analysis tool. Um, but yeah, we thought we can make it more simple and make it more time efficient. I think this is also the the future with which makes it more easy to implement and so on. Yeah, Maybe awesome. you can. And just real yeah. quick, what, which tool were you guys using to screen? It's a self-developed tool. Oh, so no, 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 I'm sorry. The, the one that you're transitioning from the 19 channel was the, uh, we're using the Nexus or was it the? No, so the 19, the 19 channel, we use uh, like, we use the databases, so QEG, we yeah. use, you know. QEG Pro is what it's called. Oh, gotcha, okay. Yeah, yeah. I was just curious, you know, what specifics in terms of like equipment you're kind of transitioning out of to, to you know, your your own stuff, yeah. which is yeah, yeah. So, so. No, I mean it, it's no secret. We do uh, the the recordings. We do it with the BrainMaster device, an American company. Yeah. They enable you to do recordings of 19 channel EG, and then we use QEG Pro, which is an online based service. But you can upload um, 19 channel EEG files from several devices there, like Mitsar, yeah. like Next, and so on. And then this will generate you some PDFs. After 20 minutes, half an hour, you'll be able to download uh, PDFs. And it even you can even order neural guide reports there. Mm -hmm. So this is why we use it because it's decentralized and we can you know access it and generate you those colorful brain mappings. But you guys are coming up with your own screening tool, which is super cool. Lisa, do you want to tell us about <laughs> it? <laughs> Thanks for that. Which uses also ratios, which makes it, I think, very special. So it doesn't only use the zero, it uses different ratios. But now yeah. it's your turn, Lisa. <laughs> well, I mean, we just talked about the problems with the C-scores and the deviations and trying to normalize all the people and always trying to get them to the norm, whatever the norm is. Um, and the brain report, the EEG, is not directly linked to a medical database. So we do not try to kind of you know, fit people into that uh, norm, but it's rather based on a lot of experience and certain patterns that occur in brains, normal brains, normal again, like whatever is the norm, what normal. Um, so for example, we see, you know, in a concentration state, the brain should be in a SMR mode, but if it's too working too fast or too slow, this might not be the optimal concentration state um, and then another example would be like frontal alpha or alpha activity in general it's more the relaxation activity we kind of you know it's kind of a reflex of the brain just like you know if someone uh, if you touch a hot stove or something you pull back your hand and there are certain reflexes in the brain kind of like that so for example if you close your eyes um, alpha activity should increase in the back of your brain. It's just a sign of a relaxation. Um, and it usually does that with people, but in the EEG screening, we can measure it. If it does not occur, it's already a sign for, you know, maybe there is some kind of problem or a tendency that the relaxation is not quite as good as it could be. Um, or if frontal activity, frontal alpha activity increases, it could also be a sign for um, ruminating thoughts, the filter of the brain is really open, so if a person wants to watch a movie, the person can't focus on the movie, always thoughts are coming in, the next to-dos, the next email, something like that. So if we see these tendencies already in just you know a couple minutes of measuring, then we can already talk to the people, we can see, okay, like these tendencies are already there if that person comes into a stress situation or you know, really high pressure situation, these tendencies might even get stronger and more extreme. So you see the tendencies more as a prevention perspective, and then you kind of act upon that. So it doesn't, so here we, you know, as we mentioned before, we only use four channels. We use FC, PZ, C3, C4. So this is, as we said, not as sophisticated as, you know, if you have P3, PZ, P4, O1, O2, but still, if you close your eyes and on PC, there is no alpha activity. This is already an indicator. Mm -hmm. And we use absolute values. 
So this is kind of similar to a QEG with z-scores, but we also use ratios. For example, parietal alpha to frontal alpha. And you know, there, it is okay to have some frontal alpha when you close your eyes, but you know, if you have more frontal alpha activity than in the frontal part than in the back of the head when you close your eyes, this is an indicator. This the ratio goes into the wrong direction that you have ruminating thoughts and, and you know, there is a lot of, lot of stuff in your mind where we have this information because EEG exists for roughly 100 years so there's been a lot of research on what brain activity should occur, what shouldn't occur and again this is not a medical screening tool, it is a, a quick screening tool where, where you can indicate as Lisa mentioned when your brain is getting into more stress mode it will show those, those patterns more uh, drastic and um, the information is experience is somewhat linked to QEG and Z scores sure um, but simply research that has been done over you know decades. But I would say though the main value that we we can offer with this tool is not the measurement itself because you know this is not so hard. It's rather that we don't only do the measurement. We do the measurement, then we do some analysis of the data and phrase it into like um, you know scales and like something that you can actually read. Okay, this is already this is still good or this is already probably pretty bad or this is still okay something like this so you can you can actually get an information out of it that is not just a colored head or something that is uh, I don't know a value like 7.8 but it rather tells you the relaxation ability of this person is possibly impaired or it is basically not there anymore so you get this and it will also automatically generate you some written reports that show you that um, or that, that explain to the person in words that are understood by non-medical persons um, what it means, what you can do, and so on. And I would say our our um, idea is that we can, you know, put this tool together and offer it to other practitioners as something that's very easy to learn and easy to use. This would be the idea. So you actually don't get, you know, a few information about like where to measure what it's rather about you get a tool that gives you suggestions for certain um, patterns and then you can create a report with one click that will be automatically filled with words easily understood recommendations and can be printed out and is consistent over time so it can be done several times so this is what we are looking for to generate um, something that is really accessible for for users but also for clients and also I think accessibility is like such an, a huge point i think that's amazing because as you you were talking about those quantitative eeg systems are expensive and cumbersome to use and i think these new screening tools to allow to be able to do something like uh some form of quantitative eeg before the actual uh treatment or training is is amazing it's really yeah. awesome and what we also what i want to stress here experience is and what is also written in our report is that not only the negative things are you know being reported or pointed out because with the QEG, some databases or you know standardized reports, it always says you know you have autism, ADD, and chronic stress and a burnout. Um, but you know what we see, for example, if you have frontal alpha activity, a lot of frontal alpha activity, this occurs often with depression, ruminating thoughts. But also, it can cause you know creative thinking, out of the box thinking, and this is also what we what we stress here in those screenings that this is not only a negative thing, but we always tell people is hey. I tell you what you know those those activities are linked to or those patterns but you know it can be a good thing also if you have the checklist flying around and you have you know stuff uh, stuff that come to your mind and some people you know maybe you can you can tell some anecdotes about some people you know I had one that had like huge dramatic um, patterns that should link to a depression and those ruminating thoughts where you cannot let go and he was you know head of graphic designs and he said yeah I need this I need stuff flying around I have a, a white wall um, where I can write stuff, stuff down and you know so there, there's a lot of different cases you know maybe you can also have an anecdote or something of someone well you also see it a lot with mothers like they have to stay at home they have to keep track of everything in their family of the kids when they have to pick them up their own life maybe they even have a job they do from home or something or a part-time job and you know you see that frontal alpha and you talk to them they were like well it's no surprise to me because I have to keep track of everything and we don't you know want to get rid of that because if they wouldn't be able to keep track of the things then that wouldn't be good either so it really just depends on all the people and that's why we always stress so much that we talk to the people that we have like the objective data is not, 
you know, the true solution or something. We always, always, always want to talk to the people to see how is their life, like, you know, how can we connect this subjective daily life with this objective data and not just say, oh, you have a depression, the data shows that. And I think this is also where we should also point out that the chances and risks of remote neurofeedback are, you know, we can decentralize this and we can send someone, you know, the screening tool that is simple to use with four channels, you know, and that will, you know, pop up a report and maybe, a, you know, recommendation for a certain mental fitness training with your wearable. But at the end of the day, still, if there is brain activity, I think you need at least a Skype interview or something where, you know, you interpret this and, and make it, you know, and also the context, you know, if, if someone has, yeah, a divorce or if someone has a newborn child, obviously stuff change, you know, or medication or drugs or whatever. So I think the combination of still there needs to be a person at least sitting on a screen at the end and, and talking to someone and, and needs context information. For example, professional musicians uh, without a context, they all show in the QEG dramatic different patterns from the norm so they are all not on the zero but they need to get into the flow they need to let go so um, we always need a context and this is I think what is um, with the screenings we do in corporate health um, where one person can screen around 30 35 people a day this is where we experience and gain so much experience you know when we had a week of screening for example you know then we have 150 per person people screened mm -hmm. and talked to them and this is where we gained all this experience so I guess the division is that at some point these brain reports are comparable to like a blood test or something. So, you know, we don't want people to have this one brain mapping in their life and this will decide whether they go this way or that way. And I think this also takes a little bit the pressure out of it. So um, if you if you do this every year, for example, do a checkup and you include your brain in the checkup. And then I think this will make a lot of more sense and not have this huge impact. So and this will also then help you to put this into perspective. And I think for that, wearable or decentralized devices are very important whether it's just that you know your regular doctor has a device that is not 15,000 euros but rather like a thousand or whatever or even you can get one at home that is even cheaper and so I think in this case it makes a lot of sense to also have easy like easy to use or simple neurofeedback devices if you you know if you can add more data to to this report for example and don't have to re rely on this one appointment you had once and then I don't know so this would I guess be the vision if this is more accepted and also more common and then you can also use different EEG devices to feed the data into the report and then this becomes a common thing so this would be nice and I think also this is comparable to if you measure your blood pressure okay you you can have a stressful day or bad sleep they already know okay the blood pressure will not be you know good and maybe the next day it's the same result so you need when you measure your blood pressure you take you know your blood pressure your pulse i mean i have a smartwatch um i take it over a certain time you know and, and i want to watch you know two three four or five months and i think with remote neurofeedback or a device that is cheap enough to to have regular checkups uh, and maybe implement it into your your gym when you go to the gym and do your physical workout maybe before that you take your you know 15 minutes of you know mental fitness uh, training and also the screening to collect the data and um, use deep learning algorithms to sophisticately um, analyze it and what we for example have one well, pilot project where we did a little brainstorm is we have a person in um, well he he plays handball and um, I think this is the correct term I hope um, where you throw you know a soccer baseball. ball is it baseball? Not baseball. Uh, no not baseball like okay. <laughs> playing soccer but not with your feet Rather with your hands. Well, it's a German. Yeah, I know thing. what you're talking about. You hit it against the wall yeah. with your hand, right? Yeah. Well, everything that's not fo American football or baseball is <laughs> it's off the team, right? Um, but anyways, and he he wants uh, and he really is interested in esports, and we see this development. It's it's a huge growing market, and um, and it's accessible for everyone at home. It's remote sports, basically esports, and this is where he says he wants to build up a gym because esports, you know, you sit in front of a desktop or you know <laughs> that you don't move it enough. Esports are like video games, right? Yes, exactly. But he wants a combination. Yeah, esports is video playing video games for money, and there's a lot of cash involved already. But he says, I want to bring them to the gym and meet people, and socialize. And so he said he wants to build up a um, a gym, like an actual gym with weights they need to lift, 
And if they live, you know, half an hour or 45 minutes or whatever, then they, you know, get a free access to a virtual reality, you know, video games or stuff like that or mental fitness uh, training. So he wants to, you know, give you the reward that you can practice your video games when you do your physical workout. So I think there is infrastructure and there is, you know, gyms where people go to. So it's not a big deal to implement the screening tool if it's simple enough that you can do it yourself. I think this is what the four channel screening that we developed this was our idea that you don't need 19 channels and peeling and you know, if you have a fancy hairstyle and it's all crap you know so and i think this is if you imagine it you have a i don't, I don't want to you know um, i don't know any co company but you know they have gym members or, or gym um companies that have you know a thousand gyms all over the us if they say yes let's implement the screening tool in every thing in, in every gym and you know you pay 10 bucks a month a month extra then you have your regular screening, um, brain screening. I think this is very, very beneficial. It can also link to your your physique, your your you know body um, health, you know, because it will change your your brain activity. Yeah. So, what does the uh, training look like in Brain Boost right now when you do this corporate uh, wellness projects? I know you guys are uh, intelligently uh, using and carefully using uh, wearables along with the the clinical practice that you guys are doing. So, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, so what's, what we think is, or what we saw also with our clients is that it's the, the, um, when they use wearable devices, you need to give them more than just a device. So what we developed is uh, like a coaching handbook or a workbook that goes over eight weeks and also implements some weekly goals, daily goals, and so on. So we do have a little booklet that gives them also mindfulness exercises, meditation exercises, and other exercises, but also contains a certain... Um, certain weekly goal for using, for example, a Muse variable or something like this. Um, and so with this program, we at least have the um, more motivation on the client side. And a bit of a problem, to be honest, in Germany is um, um, data security. So this means uh, we could do a lot of cool things with like sharing this data and so on. But at this point, we're still a bit careful but we will also be a bit limited with that so a lot of people are very careful or very aware aware of their brain data so this means they having problems sharing that stuff a lot because we would like to build like a cool program around it where for example you can have a web login and you can see how much who did and put them in teams and so on but at this point to be honest it's it's quite tough so this is why we are focusing on the individual and trying to help them out as much as much as possible and the first results are quite promising we do have we do see that it is easy for people to stick with it for at least two or three months i would say this is the period of time where we don't need a lot of re reminder calls and so on and so this means um that's a, that amount of time that, that can be easily done and by then they usually pick up the positive benefits of that so they start realizing okay this does something to me it goes into a daily routine and so on but what we experience what is a, a push is you know after four or six weeks to have a personal you know another kickoff for you know uh, like like a screening day or something. So there still with the remote neurofeedback, there needs to be uh, like a personal contact um, at least, you know, at a midpoint or something. Yeah. And what, and yeah. What equipment are you guys using right now to do that with clients? Yeah. Well, we do use, for example, the the Muse headband itself can be used, and then there is also this combination with uh, Mindlift's company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They add an additional electrode, and so you have some more sophisticated dashboard. And um, this is mainly what we use. We now we also actually had some some clients that were renting like regular EGMs, which obviously then needs a lot of more training and so on. So we don't do this on regularly. But for most people, we tell them at least with the medical people, hey, but still come in here every three three weeks or so. So mm -hmm. to do this completely remote, we did this a few times, but you know it's this is something where you as a therapist really have to like stick with the patient and like give them reminders and so yeah. on well, we also have a company in austria and they you know they said let's we should come to them and train someone there uh, that is able to do your feedback a physical a physical therapist for example they have you know their own gym a physical therapist and he does you know physical therapy and massages and stuff like that so there you don't need a remote system you have a more sophisticated system and then you book your appointments where you do your you know your mental gym 
Uh, obviously, this costs more, um, but you know, this will is also a, a higher commitment for the company. Um, so there is there is a lot of money, and some companies they really um, do a lot for their employees. So and the employees want a lot from their companies as well. They I think it froze. Yeah, it did. It did freeze. Uh, sorry. Uh, hopefully, it, I've been impressed with the network connection so far. It's been great, but finally we're. <laughs> We're in a little bit. It seems to be working okay now. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you want to just cover that last part that you were saying. Uh, I think I missed about the last 10 seconds of it. Uh, well, yeah, basically what I said, it's, I repeated basically what, what I said, is that the implementation of, of a person or train a person at a company that, that is you know trained that can do more sophisticated uh, training, maybe more um, training if you public speaking or whatever, so do coaching around the neurofeedback training makes sense for some companies that want to spend more money and commit to it but the remote neurofeedback system also makes sense and come in every four to six weeks and kind of check and motivate awesome i think you you guys touched on it earlier um about like different screening tools that should be developed for this type of work i was just curious where where do you guys see this technology and this practice going in terms of neurofeedback overall and what different tools would you know make the whole experience even more effective? Well, I would say for me, um, I, I, or I always divide it into two parts. One would be just EEG analysis, mm -hmm. and the other one would be actual neurofeedback. Because I can see a lot of cases with EEG analysis that um, if done properly, can really enhance a lot of user experiences. So for example, I have seen some VR headsets, some virtual reality headsets that had some EEG um, measurement like implemented. Mm -hmm. But this again seemed to me like it was just put together too fast. There were just people thinking, hey, this could be cool. My opinion again, but yeah. people, this could be cool. Let's put it together. But I have never seen a serious use case for that. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to change this. We also work with virtual reality here. But our use case, for example, is to put students into a virtual classroom and then they can practice some school stuff, but they still will get some neurofeedback because they're constantly having their EEG analyzed. We don't have a pretty solution for this right now. We just put the cap on it and we put the EEG, <laughs> the, the VR goggles on top. But still, this, you know, we go for use case and, and value first and not what could be a cool thing let's put this together and then figure out how it works so i think though that with like more experience and also more um, need for for brain data that there will be more tools or more use cases like this where we have eeg measurements and anal analysis in, involved like if it is just a training for employees if it is uh, at um, tutoring or something like this if it is at university or if it is for studying or whatever I think um, this this is something that will go up what is needed for that I think the technology is already there at least something that is um, working okay I think the, um, like a actual breakthrough in measurement technology I, I talked to this guy two weeks ago he's working on uh, quantum technology mm -hmm. he said that this could be an actual breakthrough because I think right now the hardware is pretty much the same like it was for 50 years because then like there is just no better way to measure it if you go with like Elon Musk he says you just cut open the skull and put in <laughs> on the brain this would probably improve the signal quality but apart from that you know there there needs to be a change in technology I think this could be done with with quantum sensorics um, um, okay. Is that is that uh, magnetic encephalography that you're talking about? You say quantum, but uh, no, 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 no. It's really, it's really this future technology that takes a couple more years, where they measure, um, where they. Uh, he explained it to me. He can somehow use light to measure, like, uh, to get a very high resolution of brain activity. Yeah, it and this like, is it a near infrared spectroscopy that he's talking about? Well, it's it's not existing at this point. Okay, this gotcha, gotcha. He's working on it, and it's it's not really common technology at this point. Because I know a lot of people are working on like near infrared spectroscopy and magnetic encephalography. There are a lot no, no, of no. different ones coming out, but the, the, compared to this, what you just said, compared to that, like the quantum thing is ten thousand times higher resolution. But then again, it is all like ten years down the road or right, something right, like right. that. So this would be an actual game changer, I would say. The other things, they improve by a few percent. But, you know, apart from that, I think it's rather that, you know, people are willing to spend those extra 250 euros for something like this. Then I think it will make sense. And as for neurofeedback, I think this will, um, it will become more common 
either because people understand it before they're having more and more problems or people start having more and more mental problems. At least that's what you see in Germany. And then they figure out, hey, we need a solution for that. And then I think it will be more implemented in, in the daily routines and daily lives. Definitely. Is there anything else you guys wanted to cover today? I think uh, it's been just we a did. great conversation so far. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. Yeah. Um, well, I guess, you know, we gave you a kind of a wrap up about what we what we're doing generally. Yeah. Uh, I feel like maybe, you know, for, for today, that's OK. If you feel like for, uh, you know, you want a more like deep dive or more information about a certain thing or we want to pick one of these topics, talk about it. That's fine with us. Then you can, you know, we can reschedule yeah. for another call. I mean, we're we're in so many different fields. For example, virtual reality, we have, you know, um, a, a sort of uh, discover your body um, experience where you know, for example, the trees grow faster when you have certain activity. Right, right. There are more butterflies when you have, you know, her pulse or something. Lisa, she has a 120 pages nutrition advisor. Mm -hmm. um, she also did a lot of, you know, nutrition um, courses and so on. So we are in so many different fields. So I think we, you know, we can still, we can, we will stay in contact anyways. Um, and then we can, I don't know, share some stuff with you that might be interesting for your audience to cover. All right, guys, thanks so much for, you know, sitting down with me and talking to me about neurofeedback. I know people are going to be interested in getting in contact with you. Um, I know you're located in, in Germany. Would you mind um, just talking a little bit about, um, first of all, what cities you're located in? So if people are uh, local, they can seek you out um, to work with you. And then also uh, what, what some other options are if people are more remote, if they want to uh, contact you guys and what, what you can uh, work with them on. Sure. So in, in Germany, our like main center is also where we are right now is in Munich. And then we do have locations, another one that is close to Munich and then in Karlsruhe and Augsburg. So this is where you can find us. And you're, you know, everybody's more than happy to come here. I would say that we could um, or we are more than happy to meet people who want to do neurofeedback, who want to like be clients or, or patients, but also who want to maybe get involved with neurofeedback or with the technology itself or um, play through some use cases, something like this. And for people outside of Germany, we can um, arrange a call like this and we can also do remote neurofeedback or if they have a neurofeedback system, we can do mentoring or supervision hours and help them use it properly. This is no problem for us. And we're also looking for partners who want to, you know, build up their, their neurofeedback center or they have a practice where they do uh, different therapies but want to implement neurofeedback where, you know, we we would like to build a network, a uh, neurofeedback network with, you know, brand building, also promoting exchange, know-how, knowledge. And we have all this knowledge and experience and we want, we're willing to share. We want, you know, partner up. So we are talking to some people in the East Coast U.S., um, that want to start new feedback and you know if we guide them from the very beginning i think uh, this is a nice way to start new feedback implemented so feel free to contact us and you know let's have a little chat video chat and, and we'll see how this goes so we're open we're talking to people in hungary austria switzerland so um and us obviously canada so we are we have quite quite some people around the world awesome very exciting how can uh, people get a hold of you I guess the best way would be via email. You can go to our website. It's brainboost.de, but there's an English version available. Also contains information and you will find a contact form or just email us directly. You can give us a call as well, but you know, since there is a time difference, just write us an email and tell us, hey, please call me back or let's schedule a call or something like this. Yep, sounds great. I'll put a link to you guys' website on the video. And I know there's both uh, English and uh, German versions, so people will be able to <laughs> read the information. Uh, thanks so much, guys. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having us. Okay.